amateur genetic scientist Craig Venter, who made his name by putting a rocket under attempts a decade ago to decode the human genome, has this evening told the world about his latest audacious project. He has copied the fundamental processes of nature, breathing life into a simple microbe. It's being hailed as landmark work by his peers in the challenging new field synthetic biology, but condemned by others as little more than hyped up chemistry aimed at wooing investors. I'll be speaking to Dr. Venter in a moment, but first here's our science editor, Susan Watts. It's a world first, a living cell driven by synthetic DNA code put together by a computer. This new cell, nicknamed Cynthia, is a milestone for science. And if you believe the razzmatazz, the dawn of a new era. It's the work of Dr. Craig Venter, the controversial scientist famous for developing the super fast technique that helped crack the human genome 10 years ago. today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell. So uh, this is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Uh, it also is the first uh, species to have its own website encoded in its genetic code. Dr. Venter and his team had already pieced together tiny snippets of DNA that in a string represent a synthetic version of the genome of a microbe that's found in the wild. They've successfully inserted that DNA on the back of an artificial chromosome into a second naturally occurring microbe with its own DNA stripped out. Now they've booted up the combination and shown that it behaves just as the inserted DNA code tells it to, including that fundamental of life making copies of itself. The aim eventually is to add other functional pieces of DNA telling a synthetic organism to carry out specific tasks to order, such as cleaning up an oil slick or nuclear waste. But the big bucks are likely to be in new fuels. BP and Exxon fund Dr. Venter's work. There are billions of dollars going into this around the world. This is a vibrant science in the UK too, and here at the Royal Society, a focal point of British science for centuries, they're talking about how best to liaise with scientists overseas, not just in the US, but also in China, where their Race for Life program is already underway. But should scientists do something just because they can? It's important for scientists to ask big questions. We have a new way now to think about where life came from because evolution is a very slow process and this speeds it up. So we can now study evolution in a way we couldn't before. And that, it seems to me, is a question that was well worth asking and well worth trying to answer. This area of science is so new and considered to be so important, there's not one but two meetings on the subject in London today. The first back there at the Royal Society and a second looking at marrying these artificial life forms with emerging engineering technologies. The idea being to create applications in areas as diverse as biological machines and synthetic body parts. Where it's going is to produce, in my view, a new industrial revolution. So we now have the technological tools to really do things, coupled to the fact that we are now in synthetic biology bringing together biology and engineering. And once you bring engineering into this, then what you're talking about is an industrial output. Critics argue that we have not yet learned how to weigh up the risks of letting loose such novel organisms. Others are suspicious of what they see as science playing God. 
I don't think Craig Vent is playing God. I think he's being very human. He's trying to get more money invested in his new technology, and he's trying to avoid regulation of the downsides. Uh, this is based on very speculative benefits, but there are real concerns about how uh, new microorganisms might reproduce in the environment and potentially do harm. So we'd like to see a moratorium while, while both those issues are debated. But even those who see money to be made, or real potential for good in this work, would agree. Society will have to get up to speed fast if it hopes to question what science is now offering. One thing that the public health authorities have been using as a smokescreen to get parents to have their children vaccinated is the fact they say, well, there's no evidence that any vaccine is related to autism or autistic spectrum disorders. Well, well that's, that's probably true. Any one vaccine, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about multiple vaccines used uh, together, used often as a triad like the the MMR, for example, vaccine triad, and used in what I consider to be less than optimal vaccination schemes. We haven't really, I think, reached uh, any conclusion in the case of children with autistic spectrum disorders, but my guess is that it will be related to the multiple vaccines that they received either because of immunosuppression of these young patients who don't have fully developed immune systems anyway, or to contaminants in the vaccines. Now, one of the papers that I often cite is the fact that when commercial vaccines are checked for contaminants, one of the contaminants that's found quite often in commercial vaccines is mycoplasma. In the vaccines? In the vaccines. I'm just going to talk about what the mycoplasma does. I mentioned that it stimulates the release of these reactive oxygen species that damage the membrane. And we know what they do now. They damage the membrane by oxidizing the lipids and making the lipids unable to fit carefully uh, together. And Don mentioned the, this paper, the fluid mosaic membrane model that uh, we published in 1972. And this is kind of a classic paper. Matter of fact, Don, it was the most highly cited paper in all fields of science for 10 years going. So it was a very important paper in terms of its citation. And it holds the citation record of papers in the field of science in general. So this was the discovery of how these lipids and proteins fit together to form a membrane. And uh, one of the things that we found is if the lipids are damaged, they don't quite fit together as well in the membrane. And what this does is it leaves some gaps in the membrane and makes them transiently leaky and then ions can slip through the membrane 
And these membranes are very carefully designed to maintain a polarity and maintain actually a chemical and electrical potential across the membrane. And if the membranes are leaking in any way, these things run down and their, their chemical potential runs down and the electrical potential across the membrane is short-circuited. So what happens is they lose their capacity to produce energy because that is tied to this membrane potential. If the mitochondria lose their membrane potential, they can't do oxidative phosphorylation. They can't make these high energy phosphate molecules that are necessary for our energy systems. One of the contaminants that's found quite often in commercial vaccines is mycoplasma. In the vaccines? In the vaccines. Now, you might say, well, why don't they do something about this? Well, I just happened to, by chance, take a flight somewhere, and I forgot where I was going. I was flying back to Washington for one reason or another. And I happened to be with a city next to a vaccine manufacturer who, who was really mad because he got bumped out of first class. <laughs> Too bad for him. So he was riding back there with the rest of us and complaining of blue streak and everything. And I you know, was kind of asked him where he was going, and he was going to the FDA and so on. So we got to start talking. And I started telling him what we had found. And he started getting more and more nervous as time went on. And so I flat out asked him, I said, well, I, I know that uh, you know about this problem. And I want to flat out ask you, why don't you test these vaccines for mycoplasma? Because I think this is a potential problem. And his immediate knee-jerk response was, what are you trying to do, drive us out of business? I said, well, what do you mean, drive you out of business? I mean, it's, it's a matter of safety. And he said, and then he started hedging and hawing and making up excuses and so on and so forth. And the fact of the matter is, is they don't want to test for these types of things because it's, it's expensive to test for these types of infections. And quite frankly, I think they're afraid of what they might find. So uh, th this is part of the whole problem of convincing authorities, convincing people that uh, we need to look into this uh, much more seriously. So what kind of diseases are we talking about? Well, we now know that chronic infections play a very important role in a variety of different diseases. Now, last, uh, the last conference I spoke, I talked about neurodegenerative diseases. And you've heard of uh, many of these. Uh, they used to be very rare, things like Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You know, some 30 years ago, this was a very rare disease, and now it's not so uncommon, as I'll tell you in a moment. And neurobehavioral disorders are going through the roof, things like autistic spectrum disorders, autism, Asperger's syndrome, attention deficit disorder, and so on, mainly in the young. And the incidence rate is absolutely through the roof uh, on these. So chronic infections are often misdiagnosed or not even sought and because of this infections are either untreated or inappropriately treated. Your GP, your general practitioner, really doesn't know much about these infections. And the reason he doesn't know about these infections is they're really not discussed in medical school any longer. They were 25 years ago but they're not even taught now. And I know this because I, I taught in medical schools at the University of California and the University of Texas for over 25 years, so I know the curriculum quite well. And these are things which are really not discussed. Now, the reason we were so interested in mycoplasma fermentans is that there's actually a patent that was issued on this, and uh, Don Scott may have talked about this. Uh, this patent was issued to a pathologist that worked for the U.S. Army. Shai Ching Lo, who's a mycoplasma expert, and he was at Fort Detrick before he went to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, but he's probably published more on, on pathogenic forms of mycoplasma than any other scientist in the world. Now, patients that have these infections benefit from treatment of the infections. Well, if the medical community doesn't acknowledge that these infections are important, you're not going to get treatment through the conventional uh, medical uh, services. They just aren't going to help you with these, so you have to help yourself. Now, many chronic illness patients recover from their illnesses after long-term uh, treatment of their chronic infections. So these can be uh, 
antibiotics, antiviral, antifungal, whatever, depending upon what the infections are. But uh, those treatments are absolutely necessary for many of these infections because if they're not treated, you won't recover. And so the last point here is if these patients are not treated, they don't recover. So they remain perpetually in chronic illness states. And this is what we've seen in our population. We've seen people become chronically ill and they're chronically ill for the rest of their lives. Now, the major pharmaceutical companies love this. Why do they love this? Well, for the next 20, 30 years or whatever, they have uh, people that are willing to buy their products, uh, which uh, for the most part are palliative. That is, they can suppress the signs and symptoms, but they don't really go after the underlying problem. And again, they love that because that, that means they've got customers for life. So they're going to make billions and billions of dollars off of all these chronic illnesses. So they're getting involved in all these chronic illnesses, and they have all kinds of different uh, drugs and everything. But unfortunately, uh, very few of them really do anything to directly treat the illness. They just simply mask the signs and symptoms. So one of the things that we've done, to make a long story short and try and end my topic, is to feed patients a food which is highly rich in lipids which are not modified, which are unoxidized, and protected so that they, they're not oxidized during their ingestion, during their transport, and so on. So this is what I've called lipid replacement therapy, and I've written whole reviews on this whole process and using this, for example, during cancer therapy, which is our most recent study and, uh, to help cancer patients uh, which have this problem during their therapy because their membranes are actually damaged by the therapy often, uh, to help chronically ill patients in general, autistic spectrum disorder patients, neurodegenerative patients, autoimmune patients, all these patients benefit, as it turns out, from this type of lipid replacement therapy. And the reason is that because all these patients have damaged lipid membranes. All these patients do. What does this amount to? Well, it amounts to taking some um, encapsulated lipids and antioxidants every day. Very simple. Essentially, it's a food. Why? Because the lipids we get from natural sources, we just protect them so they're not oxidized during their metabolism and transport. And so it's a very simple thing to do. It's very natural.